Hey everybody, this is Pastor Hilton. It is Friday afternoon. I'm at home today. I actually worked this morning and made it home this afternoon. Fought through uh, a line at Walmart and did a few odds and ends on picking up some supplies for the house. And I was uh, thinking while I was at Walmart, I went in and there was a lot of people and everybody seemed like they were down in the mouth, depressed, discouraged. The sky is overcast. People have the blues and the blahs. And I want to talk a little bit about that today because you don't have to lose your joy. You don't have to misplace it. You don't have to let it evaporate out of your life. Joy can be yours, it can be constant, it can stay, it can remain, it may run low, but it can be picked back up, your tank can be filled again. And here we are in January, starting a brand new year, and I was talking to some of our staff today, and I was alluding to the fact that January is like a reset button. It's like you get to start a brand new year and your mind is thinking, okay, this is going to be great. We're going to move forward and we're going to do some new things or we're going to reset, reorganize, restructure. So it's a real time of resetting. And so you have to take on the mindset of being focused and future focused and maintaining and retaining your joy. And a lot of times you meet people who in the winter months, especially people who live in the, in the Midwest like we do, uh, when it's gray out and the sun's not shining and it's overcast, literally people get so depressed and so down in the mouth. And I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm talking about the blues and the blahs and the I don't feel good and I'm not happy and all of that kind of stuff that's just elementary and you have to you have to overcome that in the mind and one of the things I was noticing today as I was walking around Walmart uh, people weren't smiling people weren't friendly um, and you know of course I'm, I wouldn't say that's even in the summer when the sun is shining but it's just like people are down and defeated and discouraged and People are running into each other. It's things on the floor that nobody bothers to pick up. Uh, it's just this crazy mindset. And and it's it comes from and stems from not having an internal settledness, an internal peace. When you have an internal peace and an internal settledness with God, there is a joy that sustains you. And so one of the things you have to ask yourself is where did my joy go? Did my joy run out? If I'm having the blues and the blahs, is my joy hiding? Or, you know, did my joy get stolen? Who stole my joy from me? I believe that one of the greatest things for you to recover your joy is for you to take the attention off of yourself and focus on meeting someone else's needs. That's when you begin to discover great joy. And I would say that you have to give yourself the benefit of, of someone else um, in your life out of a pure joy that is not even common today because joy comes when we find ways to make deposits in people's lives and in their emotional bank, if you will, their love tank or their joy tank. When you uh, take the focus off of you and put it on someone else, there is a sense of joy that comes from being able to help someone and take the uh, c the focus off of yourself and what you're facing and what your mind is racing about and really just deposit something into someone's life. Do you remember when Jesus said in the book of John, he said, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete in John chapter 16. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. So the disciples modeled what it was to be filled with joy and the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. 
And we are to have this same joy and then model that joy. Was it Paul who said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with the hope and the power of the Holy Spirit? That is our, that ought to be our way of life. The God of hope fills us with joy. And so our prayer is that we remain full of joy. And so I want to ask you a question. Are you afraid to give to other people for maybe fear you'll end up with nothing of your own or in the end? If you want to maintain that train of thought, you'll end up holding to a what about me attitude all the time. And it's going to control your life. And ultimately, it'll confine you to a place of stinginess and soloness. God wants us to be full of joy. And so one way for me to walk in joy is when I consider myself a giver, someone who is adding value to other people. Who are you adding value to today? Uh, how are you helping someone who may be in need? One of the ways that I am able to stay full of joy is through prayer and through sharing. When it comes to sharing joy with other people, that brings joy to me. When I stay in a lifestyle of prayer and keep my heart hot and my heart is red hot, then there's not room for pride, there's not room for envy, there's not room for jealousy, and the joy kill killers and stealers that would try to overtake. Uh, we live in a, in a place that requires us to stay full of the Holy Spirit and let the joy of God burn within us. So when I share with others, joy comes to me. When I pray and I maintain my prayer life, joy comes to me. And I told someone uh, just yesterday, you know, get on your face before God and cry out to God and release the junk from your heart and your spirit. Stay in prayer. And if you stay in prayer, you're going to walk in the spirit of joy. Joy is going to be effervescent in you. And also, joy comes when we focus. Well, you know, a lot of times we become very frustrated, agitated, irritated. And, and the truth is, we're never going to be able to be all things to all people. So sometimes you have to rethink your schedule and focus on the things that are essential. For me, it's God first. And and God includes my worship and my church and my a whole lifestyle of godly living, my family, my work, on and on, on down the line. And so God first. God comes first. When he's first, it's like the domino effect of joy that stays in my schedule. When I put him first, what does the scripture say? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things are added to our life. When we become frustrated, when we are not focused on the right thing, and we're never going to be able to have a completely free schedule where we can skip to Malou, hopscotch in the play yard. We're going to have to stay active and productive, but you rediscover joy as a major strength in your life when you begin to stay focused on your assignment. I would say also to smile. One of the ways that I can remain full of joy is to smile. Smiles are contagious. I was at Walmart just a little bit ago and there was a lady uh, that was just really down in the mouth and just walking depressed. And, and uh, we kind of come to the place where one of us was gonna have to move over and you know, sometimes we are so guilty of just keeping our head down and just like, come on, move out of my way. I got things to do, I'm looking for a product. Uh, but I just gave this lady uh, a big smile and her face responded with a smile, almost like a sense of relief was on her. You know, if you give a smile away, chances are one will come back to you if you smile. Um, a lot of times, though, you can't hardly get people to look up from their phone to even know that you're standing in front of them. You know, the principle of smiling is that when you give joy away with a smile, you get that smile back. And one way that can happen is when you praise the accomplishments of other people. 
you know, we have a church full of people who are doing amazing things for God. They are faithful. They are fruitful. Now, as a pastor, my heart is for all of our sheep and all of our congregation. And I realize that probably 20% of the church is doing 80% of the work. And that's a sad commentary. And it would be easy to get depressed if you think that's just your church. But I talk to pastors all across this country and I know the state of churches and pastors' hearts and leaders' hearts. And no one's perfect, no church is perfect, of course, but every church is deals with this element. And I think one of the things that brings joy to me is when we celebrate the accomplishments of our leaders and our dream team members. I was um, very encouraged uh, every Sunday we try to, before I minister the word, I try to highlight someone in our church who is doing a great job. We call them, you know, dream team members. And basically all the people who volunteer in our church or serve, whether they're on staff or whether they're volunteering, we call everyone part of the dream team. And I like to brag on people and, and, and celebrate them because I think it's important to celebrate people and what they're doing for the kingdom of God. And, and I could just start naming people who have been very instrumental in my life. Uh, there's a guy in our church who, when I was about, you know, a few years ago, I was really going through a hard time and I had dealt with some uh, issues where I had to pastor people. And it's amazing, You people want you to pastor them until you have to pastor them. And that means you have to deal with maybe areas of their life that are off and you have to shepherd them and bring them lovingly back into the fold where they've gone off course. And then you find out not everybody who says they want to be pastored <laughs> uh, uh, meant what they said. And, and it's hard because you give your life to people and it's discouraging when people just, you know, bail. But this guy in our church, he was so, uh, he kept praying for me, kept believing for me. And he told me, you know, pastor, we need you. Don't give up. Keep that smile, you know. And, you know, I have found since that time he was there for me. And I'll never forget that. And I've been able to be there for him um, because, you know, it goes both ways that we are through the spirit of reciprocity. If you give a smile, you receive a smile. So I'm telling you, in the process of time, a smile is coming back to you. Even God will smile at you. So be quick to offer a smile. Be quick to give a kind word and uh, you know, become the person that makes other people feel good about themselves. And I believe somewhere down the line, they'll return the favor. I really do believe that. You know, I. I know what it is to, to go through depression. I, I went through a, a, what I call depression. It was never clinical and it was never diagnosed. But I remember years ago when our daughter, Caitlin, was very small and she was a baby, I went through a time of depression and I had some decisions with work that weren't working out and I was struggling to find my place. And, and I even thought God wasn't pleased with me. I thought God... God doesn't even like me. <laughs> uh, you know, I've really messed my life up if God don't even like me. And I became what we call low in spirit. And when I got low in spirit, I got critical of myself. And then I got critical of everyone else. I would go to church and uh, where we were serving in ministry, I would say things like, I'm just not being fed here. Um, and all these kind of lame jargons and things that, you know, I know are flesh and I know better. But you find yourself when you're in low in spirit and your flesh overtakes you, you find yourself making stupid remarks like that. I'm not being fed here. I'm, I'm just, you know, I just don't feel, you know. It, Jesus has never changed. That pastor was still preaching the same gospel. It was me that was struggling. And my problem wasn't with him. My problem was the man I was looking at in the mirror. And I had to do some real soul searching and repenting and come back to a place where I was once again a tither and a worshiper and a giver and someone who was serving. And I struggled, I'm telling you, I struggled. I'm just being honest, I struggled to go to church. It's like I had no joy to do anything. I was, you know, and God had been so good to me. He blessed me with a wife, he blessed me with a daughter. And I, it, 
that, in fact, that was one thing that was constant. My wife's determination to love me through uh, the place I was at because I was in a place, a funky place where everything was just, you know, blah, 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 blah. And my wife held my feet to the fire and she made me keep going to church. And after all, I was a preacher <laughs> and I, she kept saying, we're going to church. And I, I look back today and I think, you know, that was a long time ago, but God used her. And I, you know, I've heard, I hear people talk today I talk big about, you know, I need to step up my game and be with my kids and my kids need a spiritual leader and I'm going to be the head of my family and I'm going to lead better. And yet sometimes those same people who make those declarations, they forget the vow they, they made to God and the words that came out of their mouth once that feeling passes. And then they thought, oh, pastor's just harping again. No, um, that when you make an emotional decision and an emotional moment, if you're not committed to what you say, you when the feeling lifts and the emotion lifts, you go right back to your blues and blahs. And so you have to be careful that you hold yourself to a standard and continue to do what you said you were going to do. And I don't think we realize how much God is going to hold us accountable for the way that we lead our homes, the way that we lead our lives. And you know, when we lose ground and we become slothful in decision making concerning our spiritual posterity and generational blessing and raising our children, you know, for me, I had a moment where I snapped out of it and I recovered myself after months of depression and where I just did not feel good. I didn't, I wasn't happy with nobody. Listen, I wasn't happy with me. That's where my problem was. And until I got to where I could get my joy, <laughs> Uh, then I snapped out of it and I was able to come back and it took me a minute, but my wife made sure even if I was, you know, if, if I wasn't in church with her, she was at church and she had our baby girl at church. Every time the doors were open, she wouldn't let me quit. She kept me up in prayer and she was consistent and till God got a hold of my mind and she prayed me through it. Thank God my wife prayed me through a depressing season in my life and I got my joy back. I'm telling you, I don't know what I would have done if, if she would have fallen into the same funk that I was in. I probably wouldn't be in the ministry today, let alone pastoring a church. I, I'd just be going to church whenever the whenever I wanted to. Uh, whenever I took a notion, I'd become a creaster, uh, Christmas and Easter only, um, amen, and, and just go and I feel like it because it would just be a social thing to do. And whenever I felt like it, it didn't even infringe upon my schedule. But thank God she held my feet to the fire and I prayed through until I prayed through. <laughs> and you know, and I, I've, I've never seen a time like we're in today where people, you know, just give up easily and they forsake the elementary principles of, of the Christian life, like attendance and tithe and, and serving in the church. And they just go to church whenever they want to. But when they've got a problem, uh, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, surely they come running back and asking, they expect the church to do something for them. They expect somebody, but they don't, they're not consistent. They have no testimony and no track record of consistency. You know, I believe that my family, my wife, my daughter, we are serving God today. My son-in-law, my grandbaby, we are serving God today with fervor because our parents postured us and made sure that we were in the house of God and they kept a positive, upbeat attitude and instilled into us the blessing of the Lord can be increased from generation to generation. And so I pray a triple anointing upon everybody that's watching today. And if you're going through a season of, of, of tough times or a, a mental or spiritual season where you're just strained and you feel drained, Listen, staying out of church is not the solution. Your solution comes when you press to pass the place of give up and you say, I'm in it to win it. Give up the excuses. If you're going to give anything up, give up those lame excuses we've all heard before. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody knows you're an excuse maker. You don't have to tell, they know, they just know. And I've used them all myself. So get up, stop making excuses 
and just do what you're supposed to do. If your spouse don't want to go to church with you, you go to church. Don't you let anybody talk you into one more excuse. Stop all that mess. You're going to give an account to God. And, and so make sure you sanctify your house. Don't let someone else's offense keep you out of your joy. Don't let someone who is offended keep you from church. Go to church. Be about the Father's business. Let them work it out. They got to walk it out for themselves. You cannot, but you cannot save them. You can't do that. You just have to love people into the kingdom and keep going. And I believe Jesus has the power to break the back of depression right off of you in the name of Jesus. So as I was walking through Walmart today, and I was picking up my groceries and I saw that lady and we smiled and, and I said, you know, hey, um, you know, I just gave her a smile and kind of like was waiting for that moment where maybe I could talk to her about the Lord. But she kept going, but she did smile back. If you give a smile away, you get a smile back. And, and so as I was walking through, I got all my stuff done, got up to the register and noticed that everybody was fighting with the registers and trying to get all that stuff done. And, I, I made it through all that. And in my spirit, I begin to pray, God, thank you for the joy that you have given me. You know, in the book of John, Jesus said, I'm going to leave my joy with you so that your joy might remain full. There will come a time in your life that your joy will run low. That's why you have to tap into the Jesus joy. When you get Jesus joy, he sustains you. And Jesus joy is not regulated by geography. I'm not only joyful when I'm on a plane headed to Florida, I'm joyful right here in good old Indiana because I have Jesus and he's enough. He's enough. Circumstances will change. People will change. All that will change. You may have to go through sickness sometimes, all of that, financial difficulties, but he never changes. He's yet where he's always been on the throne. So keep your joy. Maintain your joy. Fill your joy tank back up and smile. Get rid of the blues and the blahs and the wish I could have's and all that kind of stuff and just stay focused on where you are. You've got so much going for you. You have blessing on your life. You have favor all over your life. You live in the commanded blessing because you're a tither, because you are a servant of the Lord, because you love God and you worship him. And all of those areas that are time, talent, and treasure that you've devoted unto God is a bringing increase of joy back into your life. So I just encourage you today, stay focused on Jesus and you will get your joy. You'll keep it and the devil won't be able to take it from you. I love you today. I pray that you have a great weekend. Come join us at Bethel Family Worship Center on Sunday. We're going to have a big time and looking forward to seeing everyone. If you don't attend church anywhere, come and join us at Bethel. We are growing families, new families every week. God is blessing. We're seeing people saved and we are actually just launching into our brand new basketball season for six weeks starting next Saturday. So we've got a lot of opportunities for you to get plugged in and I just want to encourage you to do what you do with the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. God bless you. Have a tremendous Friday. Go to church this weekend. We love you. God bless.